So first of all, my name is Peter Young. I'm the CEO and Managing Director at Young Partners. And I want to welcome you to our 33rd Annual Senior Chemical Executive Conference. So I would like to just say a little bit about uh, Young Partners. Uh, most of you uh, know the firm quite well, but uh, we are celebrating the end of our 25th year. Uh, the firm was founded uh, by a number of people who essentially were heads of the same industry groups, chemicals and life sciences at major firms. And the reason was very simple. I think many of us became very disillusioned with what, as the investment banks became larger and larger, we became disillusioned with uh, what was being offered uh, to, uh, to clients, the conflicts of interest and so forth. So the couple of things that are unique about Younger Partners, one is it's a group of very senior people who have 25, 30 or more years of experience in investment banking. Many of us have substantial strategy and operating experience. So for example, I fixed chemical life science companies at Bain and Company for eight years before I went to investment banking. And so we're unique in that one, senior people work with clients, but senior people run the projects. There's no handoff to junior people or to generalists. The other is we have a unique combination of very serious industry knowledge uh, coupled with uh, an ability to combine both corporate strategy uh, with investment banking tasks. And as we all know, many problems that companies have to face or decisions they have to face are not just uh, you know, uh, business strategy or financial or uh, investment banking, it's some combination. If you're thinking about dividing a company into two, into two separate companies, there's a business side and there's a investment banking and financial side. And so we do a lot of work for companies uh, where both sides, both skills are necessary. And as someone said, McKinsey doesn't do investment banking and Goldman Sachs doesn't do strategy work. So we're somewhat uh, unique in that we can combine the two. We are also very global. We work with clients everywhere, uh, whether it's Latin America, Europe, Asia, the US, and we work for both large and medium-sized companies. And uh, we have the same strategy for 25 years and as long as it keeps working, uh, we're gonna continue doing that. Uh, last thing I wanna say is uh, there's a very exciting set of speakers here. Um, we're gonna start out with the keynote speakers, which is a combination of Jim uh, uh, Fitterling, who is the chairman and CEO of Dow Chemical and Raj Gupta, who is the form, was a former CEO of Roman Haas, but is also on the board of DuPont and, uh, and chairman of Vantar uh, and chairman of uh, Aptiv. Uh, he has extensive both CEO experience, but also board experience. And there are going to be our co-keynote speakers and uh, we'll have them each speak for uh, 10 or 15 minutes, followed by a fireside chat uh, that where I'll be the moderator and the two of them will be uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the panelists. So uh, it's, as I said, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our two co-keynote speakers. You know, it's really interesting. Usually when you give a uh, introduction and so forth, uh, you don't have the uh, situation where everyone knows the speakers, right? So I will try not to spend much time because both uh, Raj and Jim are household names in the industry and people know them well. But I do want to comment and make two comments about it. One is we have really two veterans who really have uh, grown up in the industry and had leadership roles and done some very extraordinary things, whether it's at Roman Haas or Dow and so forth, uh, and uh, had a variety of experiences. And what I really like about this combination is that Jim, being the CEO of, of Dow, is currently running the company. And Jim, I, I, I guess I have to say that no one can accuse you of job hopping, right? I, I guess, right? <laughs> it's, uh, you've been at the same place for many years uh, uh, for good reasons. And Raj uh, didn't do this, didn't, isn't guilty of that either and had a long career at Roman Haas uh, before he then uh, sold it actually to, uh, uh, to, to Dow and, uh, and now uh, is uh, on the board of a number of companies. So we really have two very important people from the industry, but both of whom have ex very extensive experience, but slightly different uh, perspectives today because Raj uh, is, is primarily on, on boards. 
So with that, let me uh, start. And I think just uh, because we're doing this in alphabetical order, uh, I'd like Jim to lead off and give his uh, you know, prepared comments uh, to the audience. Sure, just wanted to make sure I was off mute there. Uh, thanks, Peter, for inviting me and uh, glad to be here with Raj and, and your entire group. Certainly, this has been a difficult and uh, uncertain year for the entire industry. And as we've seen, uh, the industry has done a good job of adjusting very dynamically uh, as the economies made a big change in the second quarter and have made a, a pretty nice rebound in the third quarter yet. We've still got some uncertainties ahead of us as COVID uh, takes a second wave here, and we've got to keep our eye on the ball and make sure that we can continue to deliver good results for our shareholders. Um, I do appreciate the work that you put into this in terms of bringing people together. As you know, it's not an easy industry to understand. So anytime anybody goes to the links to bring small groups together to really have a deeper understanding, we appreciate it. Uh, let me start with COVID. I think two things right now, uh, I would say, characterize what's happening in the industry. Uh, we're becoming leaner and we're, we're certainly becoming more focused. Um, COVID forced a, a really fast retrenchment through the industry in the second quarter. And what we've seen as a result of that is um, we, we hit some low operating rates in the second quarter. And I think it challenged us to see you know, who were low cost competitors and who were high cost competitors. And that's put some pressure on high cost and vulnerable assets. And, and it's also put some pressure on capital projects that were on the slate that have already been canceled or delayed. Uh, so you've seen a, a series of you know, rationalizations, uh, shutdown announcements, project cancellations, and for both for reasons of cost competitiveness or, or maybe in some cases because they lacked integration. Um, and I think most everybody in the industry has been paring down operating expenses to new lows, figuring out how to, to operate at these lower levels. CapEx, I think, is going to continue to be at a premium going forward. I think the industry is going to focus a lot on being leaner and coming out of the pandemic with fewer new projects and also making sure that the assets that they have are low cost and reliable to move forward. And at least that's our, our focus right now at Dow. It doesn't mean we won't be spending on growth capital, but the growth capital is gonna be further downstream um, and it's gonna be more uh, discreet and I'd say less of the mega project uh, type investment. The other thing it focused, uh, um, caused us to focus on was um, accelerating some strategic decisions um, around things that we wanted to be in longer term and things that we didn't. So it's it's forcing everybody to take a look at this and looking at every stakeholder with a new lens and asking ourselves how we're gonna adapt going forward. And that doesn't matter where you play uh, in the value chain or in the cycle, um, mu much of that has been necessary. So a lot of recalibration is going on. I think there is an upside that should come out of it. Uh, we saw a very uh, good step up in the third quarter. I'd say demand continues to be good in the fourth quarter. And uh, as we look at 2021, I think the expectation is, especially with news of vaccines coming, that we'll see a better 2021. And I think all of us right now are trying to calibrate just how much better uh, it will be. The global economy certainly is continuing to improve. A couple of things that are very different, I would say, coming out of this, um, and, and people will talk about them in different ways, but I think two areas that I see for our industry that are going to be significantly stronger in the long run are around digitalization and ESG commitments. Digitalization, in some obvious ways, uh, as we retrenched and it became tough for people to travel and do the face-to-face -face connections. We all moved into this type of media, but we also use digital uh, to create platforms to make it easier for customers to get access to us and our products and move more materials uh, through e-commerce. And I think we're finding out that we can be closer, we can be more efficient, we can take the transactional part of our business digital, but we can also innovate 
uh, digitally. And I'll give you uh, just a couple of examples. Through second and third quarter, uh, just because we had to shift, instead of you know some of the face-to-face -face, uh, innovation meetings that we would typically have with customers, we did about 187 webinars uh, with customers. And these, these included doing things like taking uh, digital cameras and putting them into pilot plants inside the facilities, doing actual innovation runs of, of products for customers on our machinery, and doing trials side by side with them virtually so that we could get them the access to information that they needed so that they could look at trying new products on their lines. That's pretty important. And I think it showed us uh, that we have a lot more flexibility and capability than we thought we did with digital. So smart digital strategies has come to the fore. Um, on top of things that we had done before, uh, You know, we have a, a very good one global instance SAP system for Dow, but we also have a very good e-commerce platform, our current e-commerce platform today, which comes in, largely came in through Dow Corning, the Ziameter platform, represents over 3 billion in annual sales for us today. So it's one of the largest e-commerce platforms that's out there in any industry. And what we're trying to do now is take that to more of the businesses and get that digital uh, interface there. We've also done a lot on digital innovation interface. So you can imagine trade shows have not been uh, very common at all in the industry. We've come up with some virtual 3D trade show booths, which are really immersive experiences for our customers to digitally connect. And then, as I mentioned, the, the hands-on real-time uh, experimental things that we've been doing with customers to, to keep that connection tight. I would say, um, just like it has with our employees through COVID, we've not only become a little bit closer to our employees, understanding what some of the challenges and, and issues that they're wrestling with as they go to working remotely or, or having to juggle coming into work and the fact that maybe childcare is not as available or healthcare situations change. The same has happened with customers. We've been able to move closer to them and, and have a much tighter bond and a better understanding of what they're trying to do because they still want to innovate and they still need to move forward quickly and we've got to be there with them. The other big change that is front and center for all of us um, and, and it's really uh, taken on a lot of steam in Europe but it's going to take on even more here in the United States is ESG because um, the connectivity to what we do in the industry and our ability to solve world challenges is very, very strong. Um, customer demands for innovations that are sustainable have never been higher than they have at any time. Um, and whether they're looking for biomaterials, renewable materials, or they're just looking to reduce their carbon footprint, there's a clear demand for products that help advance that, products that are more recyclable, that help advance a more circular economy, products that help them combat climate change are all in high demand. And this is an area where I think um, some true leadership, um, the industry can provide some true leadership on both sides of these and really have a positive impact on affecting climate change. Global warming uh, is a fact that we need to deal with and the impacts to the industry and to our communities are going to be real. And so we, we decided earlier this year to accelerate our own goals. Uh, over the past decade, we've had the experience to be able to reduce our annual carbon emissions by 15%. So our target is to do that again by 2030, which will bring 5 million metric tons of CO2 out of our 2020 baseline, and then by 2050 to be carbon neutral. And I would say we have a pretty good line of sight on this in terms of what's near term and what can be done today and what the affordability is and what's longer term, and some of which still has to be proven out. Um, we also have been uh, very out front in putting together different coalitions and taking actions on reducing plastic waste. And the plastic waste issue is one that I think is uh, front and center for us and everybody in our value chain. And we said there that by 2030, we would enable a million metric tons of plastics to be collected, reused, or recycled through direct action or partnerships and you'll note that a lot of customers in our value chains as well have committed to using more post-consumer recycle material. 
which may not seem like a, a big thing to people outside the industry, but it's a very big demand signal for the industry. You know, when a company not like Nestle says they're going to buy two billion pounds of materials, that's that's a big demand pull on plastics, on post-consumer recycled plastics that drives investment in, in the recycling infrastructure. And that also drives innovation for the types of materials that they need and the quality of the materials that we need. And so we're seeing that across a whole number of brand owners. And then the other target that we set was to close the loop. And one of the biggest issues on recycling, you have an infrastructure issue in terms of people being able to get the product to be recycled, whether it's picked up curbside or you're able to take it back to a grocery store and, and put it into a recycle bin. Um, the other part is it has to be able to be recycled. So you need 100% of the material that we make and that goes into packaging applications to actually be reusable or recyclable. And that really gets back to fundamentals research around catalysts and, and making polymers that are more homogenous. And so it's kind of driving toward different structures than we typically made in flexible packaging to make that happen. The entire industry, you know, if, if it accepts these challenges around carbon and climate can really provide some strong innovations and extend the growth uh, of the industry for decades to come. And I think the pandemic uh, is ironically providing us an opportunity to both recalibrate moving forward and serving our stakeholders it's, it's a good time for us to put out some big goal. It's a good time for us to listen to customers and communities and other stakeholders. And it's a good time to take a step back and, and look at what we're doing, reprioritize, and make sure that we're focusing our investments on those that really are going to catalyze greater innovation across the value chain and solve some of these challenges that are going to continue to drive demand growth in our businesses. So it's been um it's been an interesting year, a, a, a tough and challenging year, but I would also say um, it's been a, a time for us to pause and reflect. And I feel like um, everybody's got the targets in their sights, and and we're moving into a better space as we close out this year. And uh, I, for one, will be ready to see 2020 in the rearview mirror. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's wonderful, and in fact, you know, Jim, I guess. Some of the things you talked about are things that were ongoing, but some of them clearly have changed changed because of the pandemic and change caused you to either accelerate or change your thinking about things, right? Okay. Absolutely. I mean, uh, we've been working on climate change for a while. I mean, uh, we've been in discussions in the European Union about the EU Green Deal for some time. And there's a lot of talk there about a hydrogen economy and what we can do. One of the challenges on climate uh, that we have is um, most of the climate burden out of our industry is really an energy burden. It's the energy that we use to make power and steam uh, to really run our facilities. And so how do you how do you take CO2 emissions out of some very dilute streams on the back end of a process, which is already fairly efficient? You know, we moved this industry moved away from coal-fired power and steam to natural gas quite some time ago, so it's become pretty efficient. But how do you make that switch? And if you think about some of the technologies that everybody talks about, you know, capturing CO2 from stack gas, stripping it out, these are very dilute concentrations. The capital to do that is, is not affordable. You have to look at different process technologies to make that happen. And so I think we've we've got both from a catalytic side um, on dehydrogenation processes. We have some breakthroughs there. Uh, we're working on one on FCDH to make propylene from propane, which, which we believe it's an, a type of an FCC cracking approach, which could be able to deliver 20% reduction in CO2 emissions versus the best competitive way to make propylene today. We're looking at that same technology on ethylene from ethane to ethylene, which could be a 40% reduction. Those are huge numbers. But we're also looking at some things in Europe which um, might be more based on hydrogen uh, technologies, and, and those might be able to make us have a line of sight toward uh, crackers that are much more effective in the future. And I think we have to 
set our targets to see is there a way that we might have a cracker of the future that could be zero carbon? Um, and that would probably require some amount of carbon capture and sequestration. All of that is not as affordable as what we do today. So that's all going to mean public policy and smart public policy as we go forward. But I think if we want to have the right impact on the climate, we've got to work long and hard to see how we make that happen. Yeah, that's right. We're going, we're, we're going to leave the Q&A towards the end of this overall session. So let me, uh, uh, so please save your questions for the end. Uh, let's turn to Raj. Uh, Raj, your comment about this topic of adopting to change, the, you know, the CEO and board per, uh, perspective. Sure. Uh, first of all, Peter, thank you for inviting me. And Jim, what an honor and pleasure to share this session with you as a partner here. So, you know, I'm probably not going to repeat a lot of things that Jim has covered so well, but I will share my perspective from two vantage points. One is I serve on boards of industries, which are in automotive space, that in healthcare space, and of course in DuPont, in multi-business space, and a private company that is essentially trying to completely revolutionize the supply chain space. And uh, so, so I think one of the things we will look back at this, it was a black swan event. And it came on the world in a very sudden way without any of us recognizing what the impact of this could be. And it wasn't just the financial impact, but also material impact in terms of health and safety of everybody around the world. So it came as a, is really a big surprise with a huge implication. And I think uh, we all took a little while to recognize and understand it. And I would say there are certain features which are very common across every industry that I'm serving or involved with. And there's certain which are unique. So for example, the things that are very common across industries was number one priority employee safety. How do we make sure that our employees stay safe and their families stay safe? The second one with very high priority very quickly, particularly in company that are high debt or high capital expenditure is a sharing liquidity. And the third thing really was dealing with immediate consequences of what we need to do in terms of getting a break even point as Jim talked about laying off, temporary layoffs, cost reductions, plant closures, and all of those. Because the re reality was that in second quarter, which was the low point of the cycle, in automotive industry, worldwide production was down like 60, 70%. So it wasn't minuscule. Obviously, aerospace was standstill. Then you had obviously, I'm not even talking about tourism and restaurant business or, or, or the, or the or those kind of activities. There's some which were completely shut down, but even in the industrial space, it was a very uneven impact. The other side of this was that two segments really had a tailwind coming out of this. As we have seen technology, the adoption of technology across all ranges has been phenomenal. And the, if you look at the growth of Zoom, the, all the things that have come about during this process, complete change the way we work, that's all really helped the, uh, what I call the technology industry. And then the healthcare, because healthcare became center of this in terms of what new is coming that'll change the course. What can we do to, in, in between to really support ourselves? So I think you know, it was a very uneven impact on the industry. So there, while there are certain common features for each one of us to deal with, the rest of it was also very unique. So, and, and of course, you know, what's interesting from my vantage point is that our industry serves all of those industries. We serve aerospace industry, we serve automotive industry, we serve housing industry, we supply chips and all the manufacturing technologies for the electronics industry, you name it. So depending on where you were in the value chain, your business was impacted pretty dramatically. I mean, I'll share some public knowledge about DuPont portfolio. The electronics business is growing top line very robustly. 
in fact, running out, running out of products to supply. The health and nutrition business is doing very well. And then you have the construction and the automotive business, which has struggled. So even within the same organization, and I'm sure it's true with most of your companies, you are very uneven, unevenly impacted. So yes, there are certain common things, but you also have to think about how you are going to respond to this process. So one other thing I would say was a fairly common response across every company that I'm involved with, engaged with every company, is the increased amount of dialogue and conversation that was taking place. And communications really became the best vehicle because you were not seeing your colleagues in place, you're not visiting your investors, you're not meeting your board of directors. So all of a sudden, the need was there and if anything, the need increased. So basically more communication, more meetings, more conversation, staying more current. I mean, in, in one case, you know, as a board, we get weekly report from our CEO about what's transpired, where we are, how we are dealing with COVID, what's happening to the order patterns and all of that. And then, you know, every month a call and, you know, normal meetings. So I think all of a sudden the communication between all the stakeholders increased to a different level in a very different way. So while all this was going on, and I would say this is going back to the story from say February or middle of February, when it hit us through most of the, the second quarter, big time response, third quarter was improvement. And by the way, Jim is absolutely right. Just about everybody saw resurgence of business pretty sharply in the third quarter, which is good. But some of the issues haven't gone away. Good number of employees impacted by COVID, number of families employed, employed by COVID is ever increasing. So some of those are still in the background. The second thing I would say, and Jim touched on this also, in parallel, there were huge number of other emerging issues. There was a big voice, especially by the business council and business leaders in this country that we really need, and the investors, that we need to be thinking broadly about stakeholders as opposed to the shareholders and what it means in terms of governance, what it means in terms of the role and, and, and how are we going to measure, how are we going to reward and all of those things, everything around what I call stakeholder concept. Alongside, we were dealing with the issue of in ESG, climate change, racial equality, and geopolitics, rapid digitalization, and changing consumer habits. For example, technology change. You know, one of the things uh, the automotive industry has realized that we are moving to electric cars very fast. It's going to be a matter of four or five years, the 30, 40% of the cars might be electric cars around the world. And it's in response to climate change, it's in response to uh, just be 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 better, uh, more efficiency and also more independence. I think you can think even Uber and Lyft model has changed as a result of this. People don't want necessarily to have as much shared driving. So while all this is happening, people's underlying business proposition is changing. And one minor point I'll mention because it's, it's important because boards certainly are facing it that the executive compensation and talent retention has become an issue. Effectively, you know, if you're only measuring by stock price, your compensation stock price is largely recovered. But if you are really relying on the operating metrics of the company as a measuring your long-term payout, those have dramatically been impacted. So how do you kind of adjust for this pandemic in this whole process? So, so I think the, my take on this one is obviously we responded incredibly well as did the governments with this fiscal stimulus. Frankly, in mid-March, it looked like the world is gonna to come to an end, but the speed with which every government around the world pumped money in to save the companies, keep people employed, and get money in their pocket was exceptional. And I think that helped navigate quick recovery going into third quarter, but the issues haven't gone away. 
And so let me think about, and I think maybe a lot of our questions or your questions might very well be around the post pandemic world as to how demand may change and supply chains need to adjust, workplace need to be redesigned. Technology is going to be a whole different leverage or a dis disadvantage for certain companies. And we need to look at how we reshape our companies. What are the strategic things we should be thinking about in terms of looking at our portfolio and all those opportunities. So I just stop here and maybe uh, get engaged more with the question and answer. So I, my take on this one really is that I would say industry, government, financial systems really did superbly well. Uh, you clearly, the middle part of this, which helped the recovery, we have adjusted to the change fairly quickly and very effectively. And now I think that hope is not behind us by any means. Second wave might be coming. And I don't know if we really have a clear idea as to how different parts of the world will cope with second phase. At this point, it appears that Korea, China, Asia seem to have dealt with the worst. Europe at one time looked like they have dealt with the worst, but it seems to be coming back in parts of it. In the United States, we are seeing a second wave of resurgence. So how all this plays out for the companies and, 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 and the world from that business point of view, I would say there may still is a fair amount of uncertainty as we enter 2021. But at the same time, I, I think also is an opportunity. And that's where hopefully will be the discussion we can spend time on how we think about kind of reimagining the future and the future of our organizations in this new world. So let me stop here, Peter, just to- uh, no, and, and although Raji said, I'm gonna repeat a lot of what you've said, the reality is both of you covered a lot of different topics. And, you know, actually I reflect on, you know, Raj, you've been a speaker. If we've had 33 uh, of these senior executive conferences, I think you've been a speaker at least four or five times, I guess. Yeah. And I recall maybe the first time where you said, it was very interesting speech. He said, uh, and you remember this one, right? Where you said, you know, uh, you had written an article that was saying, you, you got the, the assumption that a business has to make money and so forth because you're in a business is not true. You have to look at all the structure of things and, and you have to, your customers have to allow you room to price. Uh, your suppliers have to leave, leave room between the cost of raw materials and what you could sell the customers. There's no such thing as a given, right? But also I think what I've learned from listening to Raj and also listening to Jim is what makes this particular crisis pandemic difficult is the level of uncertainty, right? Previous crisis, you have an oil crisis. Well, you can recalibrate. So, well, at this price, how do I deal with the higher oil price, whatever? Here, one of the problems is so many things are uncertain, right? And by the way, half of what Young Partners does in life sciences, and we have some very serious experts on life sciences and vaccines and so forth. And, you know, their perspective is there's a great, the number of possible scenarios of how this whole pandemic works its way out, uh, there's just a huge number. So that makes it more challenging for people such as Jim and Raj when they're trying to direct companies because you don't know how to forecast certain things, right? So you have to essentially have a game plan that allows you to accommodate a variety of different scenarios. And that's challenging while at the same time, your workers have to work from home and do all these other things at the same time. It makes it, I think this particular crisis put an unusual amount of ch challenge on the on the plate of CEOs and boards. Uh, would you agree, Jim and, and Raj? I would, I would completely agree. I think it also magnifies uh, some things that we've talked about before that are, are really coming to the fore right now. Uh, if you go back to pre-pandemic, you know, demand was at a level in our industry and in other industries where the number of science, technology, engineering, and math graduates around the world was just not enough to keep us all uh, going. And you take a look, I don't know how many of you read the news this morning, but GM announced today they're going to hire 3,000 engineers um, for their electric vehicle operations. 
So it's not just Tesla anymore, but GM's doubling down, Ford's going to double down. They're all they're all going to hire engineers. At the same time, the digital companies are going to hire more engineers for digitalization. We're going to hire more for manufacturing 4.0. And there's been a lot of discussion around, you know, minimum wage jobs and and what are we going to do raise the minimum wage to $15? I think what we're shining a light on right now is we've really underinvested in our youth and we have an opportunity through things that Raj raised like racial injustice or racial inequities, we have an opportunity here to get more people into science, technology, engineering, and math degrees for any number of industries. And if we want to be able to bring manufacturing and other things back to the U.S., let's say we're going into a phase where nations are looking to be more self-sufficient the nation wants to manufacture more of its pharmaceuticals, which has been predominantly done for us in India and in China. But let's say that we we all want to have a little bit more security than that. Uh, we all want to slow the amount of global trade and, and do more of that at home. China certainly is on that path, but maybe we're moving down that path. We're going to have to have the resources, not just the natural resources, but the human resources to be able to do it. And that means investment in education. Yeah, and I think, and, and unfortunately, um, a lot of our government leaders, they focus more on how do I block another country, and they're not spending enough attention to reinvesting in the education here. We have to, we have to find ways to educate uh, more engineers and computer scientists and so forth. It's not enough to try to block someone who, who's, you know, whether you think they have unfair practice or not, it's just not enough. Uh, you got to invest yourself in, in this. And oh, Jim, you this is like a passionate area for you, both the diversity, but also the investment in people, right? Well, you know, the other thing I'd say, the whole education system is going to change. You know, I think one of the things is amazing how from kindergarten, pre-kindergarten to universities are doing online education. And, and, I, and I think, you know, hopefully we can bring the cost of education down and maintain the quality and engage and get more younger people interested in education uh, down the road as well. But I, I think some of these, I, I, I believe that this is going to lead to a profound change in the way we work, where we spend our time, where we spend our money. And, and, I, and I think supply chains, supply chains are going to change in response to geopolitical issues, regulations, and desire to become more nationalized supply chains, especially for some critical industries. Yeah, and that was both a, pen, that was, that's both a long-term trend, right? Yeah. But yeah. geopolitical, but it was also, it was accentuated in, during the pandemic because all of a sudden, certain countries couldn't produce anything, right? So what do you do, right? Accelerated, it's accelerated yeah. for sure. 